Hi, and welcome to our weekly macro roundup. When we talk macro, try to make sense of markets that really don't make any sense, but more importantly, answer your questions so we can become better investors. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. You know, I am really glad you could be here with me today because I have a great show lined up for you. And I bet you tuned in specifically, specifically to find out what I think is going on with the bond market. And if I panicked, I didn't. It didn't change my view at all. In fact, when we look at the data, all today did was strengthen my view. And I'm going to show you. But let's talk about the payroll report first. And this is when I say, when I lead the video with trying to make sense of markets that don't make any sense. Remember, everybody thought, or investors thought, that people losing their job was bullish for stocks. Remember, on Thursdays, and 10 million people lose their job. Bye, 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 bye. And now, oh, people are going back to work. Oh, that's got to be bullish. So if you're basing your investment decisions around, say, payroll reports or things like that, how do you make sense of it? I mean, everything is just, just buy stocks. Does it? In fact, just don't even listen to the payroll report. Whatever day it comes out, just hit the bid and say, I'm, I'm in, all in, buy, 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 buy. Because that's what the market is telling you. And that's why I said it doesn't make any sense. And how do you make sense of that? Well, I, I don't really pay much attention to the payroll report other than I do read it. And, I, and that's about as far as I go with it because I know it is the most faked data the government releases. And I know we accuse other countries like China of faking data. Well, we do that too. And, and we're not beyond that as, as a country. And so I like to focus my interest not on just the payroll report, but on the weekly unemployment claims. Because what you have to take away from this report was there was 9 million claims filed for unemployment but two and a half million people somehow ended up going to work. Huh? Yeah, exactly. So let's take a look into the weekly data before I come back and talk about bonds. I know you're just dying to hear what I think about this and don't worry, I will not disappoint you. But here's what I find interesting. The most important statistic to me is continuing jobless claims. So if I'm looking at the weekly jobless data or even the monthly non-farm payroll reports, which again, I. I don't find much value in because uh, since President Reagan took office, uh, they found out that it's better to fake the reports and clean them up later than it is to be truthful. So there's 21 and a half million Americans that have received or are continuing to receive unemployment claims after their initial check. That's a depression. It's a depression. Now, mind you, they, a lot of them are getting checks and being made whole. Not all of them, but many people are. But nevertheless, that is Depression-era jobless claims. Now, do I expect that number to go down? I do. But see, people think that this is it. This was it. Oh, it's all over now. The worst is behind us. No, 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 no. This was the first effect. So how? what was the, or who, were mostly affected by the coronavirus. People who did not have a high school education was, the, was most of the people that lost their job. Now, what's the second order effect? Well, we're starting to hear large corporations, and we've been, we've been kind of hearing it, but we're hearing more of large corporations announcing job cuts. And where do we find that information is in the monthly challenger job cuts. And so we can see 397,000 jobs announced cuts because large corporations generally do not uh, and uh, just lay people off. They like to announce it so everyone knows what's coming. So the second order effect is you're going to see higher wage workers lose their job, people that are in supervisory or managerial positions. Because after all, let's say that you've cut, you know, half of your staff and you're not bringing them back. Well, you don't need all of your managers to manage half the people. So the next step is you're going to see companies get rid of higher wage employees. And that's, and that's still not the end. Because what comes after that is you're going to see states, counties, cities, municipalities, school districts, government level jobs, they're kind of cut too. Now in California, and I don't know this is true for all states, but what I do know for all other states 
is they are being hammered with unemployment claims and they don't have the budget to pay for. So they're going to have to cut. So they're going to cut pay. They're going to make I mean, I don't know if they'll be successful, but they're going to try to cut pay. They're going to try to cut benefits. They are going to cut staff part-time, full-time. You're going to watch a lot of jobs that are going to disappear. And that's the third order. Because what happens after this, you know, let's say someone who works for the state has a 10% pay cut. Is that 10% They're like, oh, well, I just won't pay 10% uh, of, of my mortgage and my car payment. No, it's 10% of their discretionary spending. So when they go pick up coffee in the morning or take their kids to the movies or go on vacation, that's where the 10% comes out of, discretionary. But what about budgets? Does anybody really think about, uh, thunk, think about budgets? You know, can you imagine what a government office is having talks about right now in terms of what their spending is going to be next year is probably going to be zero. It's going to be spend as little as possible on everything. And if you need something, someone's going to have to sign off on it to make sure you need it because we have no budget. And when you think about that, how many businesses out there exist to support government entities? I mean, there are, there are computer companies, wiring companies, you could say electrical companies, uh, not just computer wiring, electrical. How about copier businesses? You have uh, sub stationary supply businesses, all kinds of businesses who make a lion's share of their money every month providing services to governments. And what's going to happen when the copier salesman comes in and says, hey, isn't it time to replace your copier? And they say, no. In fact, we're hard we sent a lot of our people home. We're telling them not to make copies. Keep this thing running under our service contract. You know, what are these companies going to do that rely on a consistent amount of government spending every year? It's going to go to zero or really close to it because they don't have the money. And so what's going to happen then is that's going to feed back into another cycle. But we're not near the bottom yet in this employment thing at all. And so many people think so. Another thing I like to look at, and this is from uh, the Thursday data, is exports and imports. And this is really, to, to me, should be a three bull indicator, not a not a two bull, according to investing.com. And this tells you the direction of imports and exports as of the prior month. So this is good as of May. And what it says is exports from the United States contracted and imports into the United States contracted. Now, how is it that we are on the cusp of the next major bull market when the U.S. economy is shrinking. That's how you interpret that. If we export, say, farm products, airplanes, crude oil, and we're exporting less, how is that a recovery? And if we're importing less, that means consumers are doing what? Spending less. How is that a recovery? It's not. So the economy, is, the U.S. economy is contracting. The largest import economy in the world is shrinking and what do you think that's going to flow across to everywhere else? Do you think that means Asia is going to turn around because we're importing and spending less? No. How about Europe? Man, I feel bad for Europe. Their data is bad. I mean, it looks like they're going to be in a depression before anybody. I mean, it does not look good. So we have a global economy that is shrinking. That's how you read the import and export data. And if you want to say, hey, there's a recovery. If we were in a V-shaped recovery, there's so many people are like, oh, look, oh, look, the economy, bullish. Well, if we were in this V-shaped recovery that would look like this, then why are we having contracting import and exporting data? It's not possible to have a V-shaped recovery when there's less goods and services being exported and imported. Doesn't make any sense to me. So I want to sum up the non-farm payroll report with one tweet. And no matter what, you, you know, if you're a big fan of Trump, you still have to laugh at this because this is, this is so funny. But this is great. He said this back in November 19, 2013. He said, just as I said last October, census workers cooked the job numbers for Obama right before the election. Well, Mr. President, I've got news for you. Census workers cooked the books for every president. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. They cook the books every time. That's their job because, again, the Bureau of Labor Statistics figured out under Reagan, it's better to lie now and then clean it up the year or two later when no one really cares than it is to tell the truth. Because if Americans knew what the truth was, then they would spend less. But if you give people some sort of optimism, 
you know, hope that, hey, there's people going back to work. Maybe I'll be the one next. So you go out and spend. That's the whole point of this is they cook the books. So that way people will go out and spend. All right. So let's talk about the bond market. I know you're waiting for this. I made you wait too long, but it's okay. There's something interesting going on. And this week, and I don't rem I think it was on Wednesday, something very, very unusual happened. The Fed was doing their QE, their daily QE. And I believe for the first time in history, they did not buy the allotted amount. And it was on 20 to 30 year treasury bonds. And the reason, and they didn't give a reason, the Fed didn't say why, but they bought 70% of their allotment. And the view was that, well, there wasn't as many offers. And so the Fed decided not to buy as much. No one knows ex exactly why there weren't that many offers, but for some reason, the commercial banks did not offer up as much, as many bonds as the Fed, I guess, deemed satisfactory. So they bought 70% of the offer. Now, why is that? Because there's a couple things that are potentially going on here. One, there's been an aggressive amount of selling in the treasury market. So if you're a stock bull and you want more QE, what would you like want to do? You want to drive interest rates up, right? Because you want the Fed to panic and do more QE. The problem is when stocks are high, the Fed's not going to do it. So it's really kind of math backwards on that. But nevertheless, that is one argument that perhaps that the market is finally just, just pushing its weight to drive interest rates up to get the Fed to do more QE because you cannot have an economic recovery with higher interest rates. Do the math. Look, how do you do it? You want people to buy cars? Go well, good. Hey, guess what? That, that lease you're turning in, I got a great deal on a new one. It's a higher payment. Uh, no, thank you. Look, you have to, recoveries need to occur with lower interest rates because you need people to go out and borrow. People tend to not borrow when the interest rates are higher. They just kind of don't do that. Or if you look at the charts, and we will in a little bit, what you saw is, is a tug of war, okay? So you've got the bulls and the bears, right? And they're going back and forth. And the bulls are the, or the bears. <laughs> I guess I should look at which, which arrow I'm holding. Uh, the bears that are the people that are selling, the bulls are the people that are buying. So they want higher rates, they want lower rates, and there's a tug of war going back and forth. And all of a sudden, the bulls just said, nah, whatever, and the bears take off. Now, why would that happen? Why? It seems weird. Well, there's a lot of talk about the Fed doing something called the yield curve control. They've been talking about that. And there's a Fed meeting next month. And who knows more about what the Fed's going to do than anyone? Because who does the Fed talk to before they make decisions? The large commercial banks. Huh. So the same people who decided they didn't want to put that big of an offer up in, in this week's QE auction, Huh, maybe they know something. Do they know something? Maybe they want more long-term bonds. See, that's what I interpreted this. If they're not putting as many offers up at an auction, it's because they want to keep them. And then all of a sudden you see the long end of the curve spike the last three days. Now it's been trending down, uh, trending up the last three weeks, but it really spiked the last three days. And then a bunch of buying comes in today and not on steep volume. There wasn't, it was almost like they're just cleaning up whatever's left out there. So it makes me kind of wonder, somebody seems to know something's coming. And for some reason, they want long-term bonds. Hmm. So the question is, and I want to use this as a learning example, is are rising interest rates inflationary or deflationary? Because we're hearing now words about stagflation. And stagflation is nothing more than rising interest rates in, during a period of, of low, high unemployment. That's really bad news because, again, people do not borrow money when interest rates go up, and they really can't borrow it when they're unemployed. I mean, that, that just, just makes sense. So are rising interest rates inflationary? Yes and no. Got it? Okay, so here's how it works. Are higher interest rates inflationary? Yes, but when? See, it's always a condition. This is one of the hardest things it took me as I was trying to teach myself how the system worked. 
you can't just have a blanket statement and say, well, higher interest rates are inflationary, lower interest rates are deflationary. If you believe the opposite, whatever it is, you can't say that. Higher interest rates are only inflationary if what? If what occurs? There's something that has to happen. Do you remember what it is? Do you know what it is? If it comes with lending demand, right? So if interest rates are going up right now, what we need to do is look at the weekly credit data to find out if there's an increase of lending demand. Because if there is an increase in lending demand and interest rates are rising, that is inflationary. But what if in, in, uh, in <laughs> lending demand is flat or declining and interest rates are rising? What does that mean? That's deflationary because it means people borrow less because rates are going up and the consumer is saying, nah, not interested. So the question today is, is this recent increase in interest rates going to hold or not? Now, I already knew what the numbers were going to be. And he said, well, how did you know that? Because <laughs> we've been looking at them every week. It's pretty obvious. You know, when there's 21 and a half million people on the unemployment line, you can kind of guess where the credit demand is going. And if you can't guess, I'll help you out. It goes down because you can't borrow money. Like, like my son who sells cars said, man, Steve, he said, if I could sell cars to people on unemployment, I would be rich. And he's right. He, he would be because they all want to buy a car. They, they have nothing to do. So here's the thing. Rising interest rates without an equivalent increase in lending demand is bad and will be reversed. Now, let's go look at the data. Now, of course, I did not know what I did not know what the data was coming today, but I had a hunch. And this is what I love about macro because, you know, macro is a long, long game. And too many people have investment deficit disorder. Their long game is like week to week in the market. Look, when you can legitimately buy a position and say, I'm going to hold this for a few years because I'm that convicted about where I'm going, that's macro. That means you're a long-term investor. Now, does it mean you have to do it with all your money? No. But I know where the bond market's going, and I know this recent increase in interest rates is going to be undone, and I will show you why. So we're seeing securities and bank credit. This is not this week, but the week. This is all the week before. Small increase in uh, mortgage or uh, small increase in mortgage-backed securities by about nine billion. They're getting rid of some of their treasuries, but again, the Fed is still buying. And what we're seeing here is a trend where the banks are struggling to hold on to treasuries. And this is partially could be why the Fed is backing down on its purchase program because the banks kind of, they start to load up and then they offload them to the Fed and then they load up and offload them to the Fed. Remember we were in March, they were at 970 billion. And then by April, bam, lower, lower, and they haven't gotten back there. So it tells us that the, you know, the, the quantitative easing program, the Fed's trying to micromanage it and maybe they're being successful with it. So let's look at loans and leases at all commercial banks. Big drop of what, $24 billion? Um, yeah, $24 billion. That's pretty substantial. Commercial and industrial lending, big drop. Why is this happening? Because these were revolvers. These big loans were credit lines. I think I explained that a video uh, earlier this week. And so companies are out borrowing uh, or, or issuing stock, but mostly they're taking out, you know, bonds or debt to pay off these short-term revol what are called revolvers or credit lines. So that's going down. How about real estate loans? Oh, that's dropped by 8 billion. So that's not good. We can see real estate loans are not going anywhere. How about commercial real estate loans? Those are down $2 billion. How about consumer loans? Down $5 billion of that, all of it being pretty much in credit card debt. So there you go. So this increase in interest rates that we've seen here is transitory because it's actually tightening financial conditions, even though normally rising rates are a sign that are, they're easing, but they're only a sign if there's an increase in lending demand. So did you see an increase in lending demand? No, I didn't. So there you go. That's how you know. All right, so let's go and look at the rest of the data. That's why I wasn't worried about this increase and in wherever my mouse went, which I can't somehow see for some reason. Uh, that's a problem. Let's try. Hmm. The, that's odd. The pointer on my mouse have disappeared. Uh, and I don't know how to switch screens without it. 
I don't know where it went. Let me try closing something. Uh, if you're wondering if this is live, it is. Uh, this is not good. Let's try closing a couple things. All right, mouse is, oh, this is really bad. I'll close that too. Ah, mouse is back. Okay, good. Whew. I thought I was gonna actually have to edit a video. That, there's rules about that. Okay, let's go through the charts. M2 Money Supply is showing that it is starting to peak and flatten out. And remember, I said this is probably happening. Six month rate of change is flattening out. Three month rate of change is flattening out. And now that I have to reopen my browser window, I will do that while we continue on to the monetary base, which didn't have an update this week, even though they're supposed to. Which means the money multiplier, as I predicted, would start to hell, head down, is down slightly to 3.48. And again, a falling money multiplier is deflationary. Now, the reason I wanted my browser open was I need to show you a chart, but I'll let it work in the background while we go through these. Real estate loan growth down 3.89% from a year ago. Six month rate of change down. Three month rate of change is 0.55% falling. Mind you, we don't generally see this go negative unless we're in a recession. And it doesn't go deeply negative, but here we are, stocks near all-time highs and real estate loan growth, which is the big daddy in lending, is headed towards zero on a three-month rate of change. How about commercial industrial lending? It's down across the board, but still very high. And of course, loans and leases and bank credit, all commercial banks, of course, is down and falling because, well, real estate loan growth is falling. And then consumer credit card growth card growth rate is down 7.11% from a year ago. Consumers are taking their stimulus checks and paying off their debt. That is what is going on. Now I want to take a look. Oh, you didn't see any of that, did you? Well, you heard it. Let's go back there. I'm sorry. Gosh, sorry. Money supply peaking and rolling over, monetary base doing nothing, money multiplier falling, real estate loan growth falling, 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 no lending demand anywhere to be seen, not even on my screen, which you can't see it anyways, because I am having trouble with my mouse apparently. Okay, M2 money supply. Why am I interested in this? Because institutional money flows is headed down. And remember the money multiplier, the big, key of the M2 is the money sitting in institutional money funds. It's coming out and the Fed is still easing. And that means deflation. The next wave of deflation is indeed coming. Back to the PowerPoints. Small cap, Ford, price to earnings ratio. Wow, that's a record high. People like small caps. They like buying them at a high point. How about non-commercial S&P 500 position? Large net short is not always bullish. I forget who uh, published this, but I really think it's cool. So you see that uh, hedge funds and other speculators are near record short positioning, and that tends to almost mean where the market peak. Why are they short? Because they're hedging their long equity positions. And when you have too many people on one side of the fence, it tends to roll over. This chart I thought was interesting. The NASDAQ versus S&P volume ratio is just off the charts. And that is often signal of a near term market peak courtesy of macro charts. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's uh, go and look at the bond chart. I know you've been wanting to do this. So let's do it. Clear out some of these things off my background. Okay. Here we are on the easiest thing to look at is TLT, which is the effectively the opposite of 30 year bonds. And what's interesting is I had to draw these the supply zone in on Thursday. And a supply zone is where buyers and sellers meet. If that sounds like a commercial, it could be. So here is where buyers and sellers once were. And then all of a sudden it was almost like the buyers were like, yeah, whatever. And they just let the sellers go. And there wasn't a lot of selling volume. They just let prices fall. And then they came in at the bottom, effectively the bottom of this supply zone and came in and on fairly decent volume bought a bunch of that up. So they've been soaking up the supply. Now, if you want it, this is not a good chart of exactly what a market bottom looks like, but you can see as prices went down, volume started picking up. And when you look for a bottom, you look for where the volume tends to peak out 
and then start low and then reverse direction. And so somebody was very interested in soaking up all of this supply and they did. Now, from a technical standpoint, it would not surprise me if this is quickly reversed next week. Now, how do I know that? Well, you can look and see between the supply zones, the very first time it, was, it gapped higher. There was no buyers and sellers in between this gap. And when it came down, it shot right through it. And then the next day it gapped up to the open and shot right through it. And then after sitting down here at the bottom, it shot right to the top. And then the next day shot down again and then up, up. So what it's telling us is there's not one, there's like no buyers and sellers right in between the zone. And we can see there wasn't a lot of stuff traded here. And when you have a gap between supply zones, prices tend to move very quickly. And you can look back in history and the faster it tends to move, the, the higher the probability it will move through the supply zone quicker. So we do know now that buyers are sitting down here buying it up. And will the Fed make some announcement that the large commercial banks happen to know about driving this back up? Or is it that they soaked up all the supply and this will zoom back higher like we've seen here? We don't know, but we know the probabilities are pretty strong that there will be a fairly quick move back up in here. So that's why when I saw this, it was no reason to panic. All right, let's get to some of your questions. I had all this lined up before my mouse disappeared. And then I'm going to do another video uh, when I complete this one, I'll, I think I'll release it on Saturday. There's a lot of more detailed questions. These, uh, these are my more rapid fire questions that I want to go through the shorter ones. So let's take a look at them. And on we go. Hi, Steve. Hope all is well with you. It is. Thank you very much. Just a question for your video. Could you list off the things that you would say cause a day to day move in bond yields? Just trying to get a bet, trying to get better educated. I wish I knew. And I don't. There, I, there's no way to know. If I knew that, I'd be super rich. Did the gold standard restrict the supply of money? Yes, it did. And did going off the gold standard cause the terrible inflation we had in the 1970s? Yes, it did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And well, my friend, thank you. Next question. My, uh, hey, Steve. Hey, back at you. My question for you is how would long-term yields be affected if the Fed decided to cap short-term yields? Great question. The answer is doo -doo -doo, down because remember long yields follow shortly, short term yields. I subscribe to your YouTube and really enjoy your content. Well, thank you very much. A question, if you don't mind me asking, I don't. Does the Fed buying treasuries have a positive relationship with the bond price? Yes, it does. The Fed acts as a yield suppressor. So uh, if yields start to push up, what happens is QE kind of just pushes them down. Or if you want to look at this, it just keeps them down. It doesn't cause yields to go down. It's a yield suppressor. So, and if they buy enough of them, they can make yields go down by taking them out of the supply of the market. And we kind of talked about that in other videos where if you can't sell these things or do anything with them, because there are none of them, because the Fed or another central bank owns them all, yes, they can force yields down. I think the argument is based on the fact that interest rates are already so low, so there's not much more room for them to go down. People have been saying that for years. I suppose a better question is whether or not you expect them to go negative, and I do. I expect the 10-year Treasury yields to go negative. I would not be surprised at this juncture if 30-year yields also go negative. I mean, I mean, here's the answer. Look at what's going on in the credit market. Real estate loans are very, very critical to the recovery of an economy, and they are declining every week and are nearing negative territory. And usually they get at the worst, you know, just a little under you know, negative 1% on a quarterly basis. It's looking like it's going to be worse than that. So, yeah, I think rates have to go to zero or, or negative in parts of the curve. Absolutely. But even if rates stay above zero, you can cut them in half indefinitely and bonds will respond in kind. Yes, that is true. What's a good way to monitor what the Fed is actually buying on a given day, if that's even possible? It is. How can we tell if they're buying much more or less on a given day and of what securities? How about what actually gets auctioned and bought on a given day? Great question. And I have the links for you. So you'll go to the New York Fed website. Under market and policy implementation, you'll go to treasury securities, click that. And over here it says operation announcement. This is for the day's operation and the schedule is for what their plan schedule is. And you can click on the PDF and take a look at that. There's also one on 
if you do the same thing for mortgage-backed securities, you'll find the same place under the same, there's a subheading for mortgage-backed securities. Hi, Steve. I hope you and your family are doing well. We are. Thank you. A uh, question for you. What are bond yields? Why are bond yields been going up day after day for the last week or so? What could be the cause of this? Um, I think we kind of answered that in today's video, but I still wanted to read your question is, I think the, the big commercial banks, large commercial banks know the Fed's up to something or there, there's a reason they want these bonds. There's a reason they want them because if you look at the, at the real estate data, you could say they don't need them because there's lending demand is falling. And when lending demand falls, yields fall. So speculators are driving yields up. So either speculators driving yields up to get the Fed to do QE, or it's the big players letting yields get driven up because they want to buy them knowing that there's going to be a big collapse. Well, we know there's going to be a big collapse because the, the lending data tells us that. We know that. So, uh, okay, so far my hunch of 1.6% 30-year nominal yield seems to have been right somehow if you read my last message above. Here's the last message. The Fed seems to be happy for now, which is why I'm thinking they might let rate go to 1.6% for the 30 year, but that's my hunch. I have a problem with this because the Fed doesn't control the rates on the long bond. So the, look, if you, anybody thinks for a minute the Fed wants higher interest rates, they don't. Because look at the real estate lending market. You want a recovery? You got to get people to buy and sell homes. Not happening right now. So let's go back to the rest of the question here. Do you think we'll see yield curve control take action before or after the next, mean, next Fed mean? You know, before this week, I would have said no, but is there something cooking? It seems like, Steve, the Fed seems to only take drastic or historic actions only when stocks are hurting. And now NASDAQ is at all time high. The weekly hedge fund position you share still wasn't showing as much shorts on the QQQ. That's right. So, and I is right. Fed doesn't do dramatic things unless the markets are down. So I guess I'm not expecting anything, but something's cooking underneath. There's something going on. There's a reason somebody wanted all those bonds and they were willing to go out there and get them. And I don't know what it is, but I imagine next week when we hear Fed uh, Chair Powell speak at after the FOMC meeting ends on Wednesday, I'll be tuning in and uh, I will have my thoughts and his comments for you on Wednesday to go over then. But in the meantime, for anyone that's concerned about interest rates going up, remember, yields go down when demand for lending goes down. And what is lending demand doing? Well, it's pretty bearish right now, isn't it? All right, well, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for taking the time to be with me today. And I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow in an all Q&A marathon with your questions and my answers. Have a great day. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. Materials not to be construed as a recommendation or solicitation by our selling security financial work instrument or to participate in any particular training strategy. This video was paired by Steam Van Meter on personal capacity. The opinions expressed in this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advice Inc. or Steam Van Meter Financial.